All right. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of What Should I Read? I am Meredith here with you today, and I have a special guest star. That's right. Heather is with us today as well. You get a fresh face to look at. Not outside of this stretch of the imagination, for what would you read? I am not just going to bring books to the table. That's right. Today is read and listen both. Your special guest star today, I'll let her do a formal introduction, but you may recognize her from the reference floor. You may have received an email from her, but she has a huge role behind the scenes at the Cedar Rapids Public Library. So without further ado, Heather, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself briefly and a little bit about what you do, and then we'll get into some recommendations from the backside. Okay. I'm Heather. I work at the Cedar Rapids Public Library with Meredith. Uh, I work in the materials department, and I'm a materials librarian. So I look at materials. Um, so I order books, music, and movies, and I have a heavy interest in all three of those things. So this is, uh, re uh, this review is a reflection of my personal taste and also a reflection of what is in the collection at the library. Side note, Heather happens to be one of the most interesting people I know, and when I asked her to do this, I was extremely grateful and extremely excited to see what she would bring to the table consequently. So she has chosen three different items to review today. We got one book and two albums. So without further ado, Heather, tell the people what they've won. Okay, so what you have won are three <laughs> current reviews for three things that have come out probably within the last um, six months at least. Cool Town may have come out at the end of 2019, but I don't think so. I think it came out in 2020. I think it just came out in the last couple months. Anyways, that is rambling. So the first thing we're going to talk about is a book that is called Cool Town, um, How Athens, Georgia Launched Alternative Music and Changed American Culture. So if you have any interest in bands like the B-52s or R.E.M., or even other bands like Pylon or Kilkenny Cats or the Squalls or the Barbecue Killers, then you might have an interest in this. This is um, an anthology of names, events, places, um, movements that shaped post 70s and early 80s alternative music. So it's based out of Athens, Georgia, which so it, it challenges a lot of the Southern narrative. Um, it has a university in Athens, which had a thriving art school, which is part of the scene that all these people came out of. And, um, you know, the B-52s really launched at a house party in 1976. But the, the scene really went on until REM broke big in 1988. So I would say it's an important 12 year chunk um, of music of, of a group of people that all created um, a, a DIY scene. So they had their own coffee shops, they had their own look, they, um, you know, these were people that weren't working to make money, they were just working to hang out with their friends and um, go see bands and be in the bands. The book is written by Grace Elizabeth, Elizabeth Hale, who is a professor of history and American studies at the University of Virginia, but she was also part of the scene who was in a band and owned her own coffee shop um, and met her husband there. Um, so it's really, it's an interesting story. It gets a little thick with names and dates, um, but there's a lot of important relationships and and um it's interesting how this local scene blossomed into something that also was shown on mtv at some point and so like kids like me who were you know like 13 years old in the 80s would see it in my basement and be like whoa holy cow i'm gonna take my grandma's christmas money and i'm gonna go walk to goodwill and you know, i'm gonna go by myself <laughs> some bohemian clothes and this is going to be my thing, you know? So it really expanded um, people's visions of what music was, especially in, you know, counter to what the eighties really was with, you know, Huey Lewis and the news and, um, you know, boy bands and kind of the excessive 
you know, pop music. There was also this like real underground scene that was happening. And like I said, it, it ended up facilitating larger because of the channels that were available at the time. But um, so yeah, so the book is like 290 pages um, of this history. I just find it remarkable how a culture that like, full disclosure, I didn't read the book, but I did my homework. I read a review and mm -hmm. I find it really interesting. One of the comments in this review was how the author really demonstrated how this community held itself up and worked together and was collaborative and how such a small kind of like microculture really influenced not just the nation, but, a, but generations. Because I feel like the, the, there are elements of what was going on in Athens, Georgia that carried over to like when I was going to school in Iowa City in the early 2000s. You know, like it seems very familiar to me in some ways, although I was never in a band. I hung out with plenty of people that were in bands and it's like, well, yeah, that's, that's just what we did. And it's interesting to think that like, this could be one of the best examples of how that culture really started. Yeah, I think it was, um, I think it was not the only scene that was going on, like a, the only local scene, but it was, it was one that got big and people kind of, it was really kind of a, you know, there had been Southern rock and classic rock, um, but it was really unique. I mean, it was something, you know, coming post punk rock, um, you know, the B-52s were kind of this like party band that was real like lavish and and out there and then like REM was very bohemian and, and almost like you know influenced by more folk music yeah. than anything so you know and they didn't necessarily want to be associated with each other they weren't you know they were but but journalists and people kind of were like oh what's this thing happening in Athens and what is the what is the vibe that's happening down there that's creating this music and and really, you know, there was in the surrounding area, there was, you know, folk art, um, there was food happening. There was, you know, there was just people that were experimenting with different things. So I think there was definitely a culture in Athens that was supporting it. Um, there was, you know, their own, pub their own local publications. I mean, it was just its own scene. So uh, one of the points that the viewer made too, that it had this constant influx of youth and people rediscovering it because it wasn't a college town. And I think, right. you know, having gone to college in Iowa city too, like you feel that like, I mean, there's something to be said for that kind of energy and vibe. Right. That it's kind like, of like creative new energy, that enthusiasm or, um, yeah, just that youthful energy. There's also an availability of time too, even if you're going to school and working or whatever, you know, it's right. more often than not students don't have, you know, small children or things that like occupy people's times otherwise, or aging parents that they're taking care of too, you know, like any number of right. reasons, but Athens just had this like perfect storm of things going on. Right. And, and, this and national and international recognition, but like right. emblematic of something that was happening everywhere kind of too. It's really fun. Right. Right. It sounds like a good one. If I yeah. didn't have small children, I'd be reading it. No joke. Well, if you're not familiar with the bands, I mean, keep YouTube close to you because you'll want to look up videos. I mean, there's recordings of all these things. There's actually a, a big documentary that was made in Athens during that time that is available on YouTube where you can see the bands playing. Um, so, and she goes through some of what the recordings were and where people were playing and the different tours and stuff. And you can look them up and, and see recordings of them. So it's, it's could be a good introduction to, for some people and, you know, for other people, it's reminiscing. I think it, that that's an excellent point too. I just love how, what a submersive experience it could be to read a nonfiction book written by a participant in the scene while pairing all of these like actual audio experiences with it. Like you get yeah. the, you get to see them. And if it's, you know, of the same um, era, like you get to see like in the moment, like what they looked like in 1985 doing their thing or whatever. Like yeah. really totally travel back in time mm -hmm. with this book and engulf your senses if you wanted to. 
Yeah. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. We didn't think about that before. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> I like that. Amazing. Yeah. Oh, all right. So that that is number one. Yes. Cool town, people. Cool town. Yep. Athens, Georgia. I've never been there. I've never been to Georgia. I spent some time in Atlanta, but I've you never did? made it to Athens. Yeah. Yeah. Totally I mean, um, I see Savannah looks like an interesting place too. I mean, I think that there's a lot of art and culture around that Atlanta, Savannah, circuit. Athens. Yeah, circuit. Mm -hmm. Well, I think pretty natural. I mean, um, what's the big art school? in savannah right oh, yeah like institute of design or something or mm -hmm. and then from that yeah. big like urban center of atlanta there's lots of movement in and around the region mm -hmm. people if, if if yeah that's just it when you feel safe traveling head to georgia <laughs> <laughs> let's do it i would be okay with it i would be okay with it yeah um take us like, maybe, maybe in the winter though Oh, that's helpful. That's true. Mm -hmm. That's true. You're not going to get any cooler than Iowa right now. Yeah, it's pretty hot in the south right now. But, all right, take us on another musical journey, would you? Okay, Meredith, let's talk about Loki Lafarge. He's kind of cute, I'm right? so excited about this. I know. <laughs> uh, okay, so Loki Lafarge. Um, Pokey Lafarge is kind of a vintage mix of Jimmy Rogers, who of course was the singing brakeman, and the Squirrel Nut Zippers, which is like a swing kind of Zydeco New Orleans um, band. So it is, it's probably um, country, but it's alt country, but it's also a whole bunch of other things. And I'm going to say it's jazzy, it's swing. Um, Pokey Lafarge is, I would say, a self-made musician. Um, he is from Illinois, so he was from Bloomington, then moved to Normal, and then he was, he was a busker, which is like a street musician in Asheville, North Carolina, and which has a pretty large street music scene. And he, that's where he formed his first band. So this is probably four albums in. Rock Bottom Rhapsody is the name of the album. It's on its way to the library. I think it's in the catalog. So if you are curious, you could place a hold on it and it would be available for you. Um, so it's Riverboat Chic. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I mean, if you talk about, you know, Meredith can talk a little bit about the St. Louis connection, but of course, you know, the Mississippi River goes through St. Louis and, and there's a whole um, mood about the Mississippi River and it's a little swingy and it has some music that goes with it. And Pokey Lafarge is kind of that mood. Um, it's really fun, but it's a little dark too. Yeah, there's something a little ominous about it, I think. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that um, he's not singing about, it's not a light album. It definitely has some um, themes that are dark and maybe a few swear words. And um, But I really loved it from the first time I listened to it. I played it. I mean, you could also listen to some, you know, stuff like this on Spotify. You know, if you just want to check it out and listen to it for. Watch the YouTube videos. Yeah, watch the YouTube videos. And amazing. They're right. Beautiful. Right. I mean, it, it's, it's a total myth that there are no more music videos. They just have all migrated to YouTube. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I was, I was floored when I started because I'd never heard of this guy before. I never heard of him until you brought it up. And then so I started doing my research and I found the videos for this album. And I just couldn't believe that I'd never heard of him before. But like the images are so haunting in some ways. And so like just kind of like the cover, you know how it looks like the um, like a black and white photo touched up with color 
like the mm-hmm. early 20th century photographs, right? Right. It's like, and that's part of the reason why I think it's kind of haunting and ominous is because not just like him dressed as like a devil or something, but right. it is so reminiscent of a different time and place, but it's modern music and because again, I read a review, like this album is about his own experience. It's of a modern time as well. And it just, it just doesn't quite make me feel like I'm neither on earth or above, you know, it's like somewhere in between. And what I think is really cool about this album too, is if you don't mind, I'm going to read from the American songwriter review or article about this. But when, um, when he was, Making this album, he said, I was kind of predicting my future and my inevitable fall from grace, if you will, hence the rock bottom, just trying to write myself through that and write myself out of it and hoping that the song would, songs would heal me. And there are so many things that I think that are interesting about that. And, you know, I thought about it at first and then just recently I reread that and I don't often think of, and this is totally totally wrong with me, but I don't often think of musicians and artists creating art necessarily to like heal themselves, Mm -hmm. but it does that. I feel like the stuff they make heals me. Right. Right. And it just took a whole different kind of ownership of an album in this case for me. That was fascinating. I thought. Yeah. I think knowing the stories behind albums or even songwriting, you know, just, amplifies the meaning that much more, you know, like understanding the artist's personal experience. And in this case, he had been living in St. Louis. He was in a long-term relationship. Like I think he was in St. Louis nine years and then in a relationship for seven and the relationship ended and he moved to LA and he'd never lived in a big, big city before and ended up there. And most of the songs towards the beginning of the album are about hitting that kind of rock bottom, right? And being kind of spun out or whatever. And then there's this hi, song. Hi, can I help you? Hi. Oh, go to my message. It's summer. Um, and then one of the last songs is, what's it called? Lost in the Crowd, maybe? Is that right? Yeah, Lost in the Crowd is number six. About Um, you know, about not only him coming to this big city and feeling lost in the big crowd, which is scary and wonderful both. Like Mm -hmm. I was such a nervous person growing up. I started college at Mount Mercy and I'm like, "Mm, I could do something a little bigger. And so I went to Iowa city to the university of Iowa to get lost in a crowd, right? Like that was my big city at the time, but it felt great. It was scary to leave, but it felt amazing. And so now I went. I went when I, when I was, um, 18, I moved to Portland, Oregon and (laughs) I didn't know anybody, but, um, this, the friend that I had traveled out there with, we were walking down the street and a guy just, you know, he was like, he looked at me and he was like, Oh, I can't believe I'm seeing you here. And it was like, I had to look at him and it was like, I don't, I don't know who you are, but I was like, okay, <laughs> I just kept going. And I was like, that's so weird to be on the other side of the country. And somebody looks at you and is like, feels like they know you, you know? When are you going to write that song? <laughs> I'm ready. I, I, had, I had a very, um, I had a sense for a long time of uh, fate, like divine, um, you know, planning or something but like I was just following something else and then I was just appearing like on time where I was supposed to be everything happens for a reason yeah right like the Pokey Lafarge album yeah (laughs) (laughs) I love it I love it oh well speaking of universe are you ready for your next review yeah let's do it let's roll right into it I feel like okay. the next one can make you travel the universe from the comfort of your Definitely. own life. Yeah, that was when we talked the first time. The word cosmic was real important. I was like, that <laughs> is this. Shabazz Allison, the dawn of diamond dreams. It's so beautiful. <laughs> yeah, this album. I wish there was six 
pictures of this, and I get those placers all over the place. Um, so yeah, so this is Ishmael Butler, and he is formerly of another 80s, 90s band called Diggable Planet, which had a song called Cool Like That that came out in 1992, which was mm, muy delicious. And if I hear that song, it definitely takes me back to that time. So he is still creating music. Um, he's collaborating with modern artists, um, people like Thundercat and Flying Lotus. And like Meredith had used the word cosmic before, I kind of, you know, Diggable Planets was very much in the vein of um, a tribe called Quest. And there was other bands that came out at that time that had that same kind of rhythm and feel to it. Um, and that same kind of feel is present on this album. It's layered, you know, there's percussion, there's jazz, there's, um, you know, modern DJ work. There is, like I said, you know, there's collaborations with people, there's sound, there's experimental kind of energy on it. Um, and I really like it. I feel like it's such a reflective album of our current world too you know because there are so many different layers and there's a lot of like literal noise coming from all different parts and people lots of voices being raised and heard right now and i think that the fact that there's like no normal makes me love the idea of something that's kind of cosmic and that stretches your mind and kind of we kind of we were briefly talking about this before we started recording how this idea that since there is no new normal like we can we can go forward with a new plan kind of and yeah let's think this, about what we can create yeah i think it's such a great album for right now yeah i mean if you know, the pandemic is a portal, then this is an album Let's that will bring you through. Alex, your guide. <laughs> yeah, he right? is. Yes. Well, I, think, I love too that like, because there, because things are kind of crazy right now, this whole idea that like somebody has been consistently making music and can pull from, you know, like George Clinton and Sun Ra, but also all these contemporary artists and have kind of a, like in the review that I read about this album from The Guardian, it's like how it's almost like it has a rejuvenated and more contemporary sound to it right now than some of the former work. And it's like it's gotten, he's gotten like a second wind, a new yeah, wind, all of these things. So I find that really, again, kind of empowering for the time we're in, like be consistent in some ways but yet reinventive and experimental and yes like it's a no fear of energy yes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's inspiring it is it is i think that's like the perfect way to to like mm. expand your mind well yeah and prepare yourself a little you know like through music i know that i'm sometimes very particular about what i listen to and I got to be in the mood for something or not. And like this fit the bill when I started listening to it and like days start early sometimes at my house. And this has been on my playlist, on my rotation. And it's just kind of nice to feel like you're staying awake somehow. Yes. It can be kind of, I, I find it easy to check out being overwhelmed with stuff, but this like helps all that mind, body, soul stuff stay awake. I don't know but definitely just, what do i know <laughs> oh let me show you what the um let me show you what the the actual album is clear i thought that was small just thought i'd share that with you a nice touch people still care people still care. Yeah. people still listen to vinyl do you see this yes vinyl is important I should, I should have set this up in front of our record collection that would have been the best thing i, could I know Sorry. i thought about doing the same thing but you know, backyards and art and books work out really well, too. That's what you got, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's what's okay. happening. Oh, well, I think those are three great things that all of our patrons will enjoy. 
one way or the yeah. other. Thank you so yeah. much for being with us here today, Heather. I really appreciate it. From Anytime. All of, right? Well, you say that now. <laughs> it's recorded. Can't wait, can't wait to see everybody at the library. Right, right. What are public library staff without public? Coming to you over the airwaves, mm -hmm. right? From all yep. of us at the Cedar Rapids Public Library. Yeah, Thanks we're still here. We're, so, we're, we're still doing it. We are. <laughs> Thanks for watching, everybody. Be well. Take care. Bye. Bye.